food, sewage, and stable states. San Francisco, May 6. When I arrived at the Ministry of Food for my interview with the minister, I was unhappy to find that she was too busy to see me. I was introduced instead to an assistant minister, a man in his early 30s, who received me in a work overalls outfit. His office was also surprisingly unimpressive for a person of importance. It had no desk, no conference table, no soft chairs. Along one wall was a cluttered series of wooden filing cases, bookshelves, and tables covered with papers in utter disorder. Against another wall was a kind of laboratory setup, with testing equipment of various kinds. The assistant minister is, like many ecotopians, unnervingly relaxed, with a deep, slow voice. He sprawled on woven cushions in a sunny corner of the floor, under a skylight with some kind of ivy hanging near it, and his lab assistant produced hot water for tea on a Bunsen burner. I squatted awkwardly, and began by asking my carefully prepared questions about ecotopian agricultural output. These were ignored. Instead, the assistant minister insisted on giving me a little background. He then began to discuss, not agriculture at all, but sewage. The sewage system inherited from the past, according to the assistant minister, could only be called a disposal system. In it, sewage and industrial wastes had not been productively recycled but merely dumped, in a more or less toxic condition, into rivers, bays, and oceans. This, he maintained, was not only dangerous to the public health and the life of water creatures, but its very objective was wasteful and unnatural. With a smile, he added that some of the sewage practices of earlier days would even be considered criminal if carried out today. He said, In my papers over there, you can find historical reports of great sums being spent on incinerators to burn up sewage sludge. Their designers boasted of relatively smog free stacks. We were, of course, accused of sewer socialism, like our Milwaukee predecessors. Nonetheless, we constructed a national system of sludge drying and natural fertilizer production. After seven years, we were able to dispense with chemical fertilizers entirely. This was partly through sewage recycling, partly through garbage composting, partly through reliance on some novel nitrogen fixing crops and crop rotation, and partly through methods of utilizing animal manure. You may have seen from the train that our farm animals are not kept in close confinement like yours. We like them to live in conditions approaching the natural. But not only for sentimental reasons. It also avoids the gigantic accumulation of manure, which is such a problem in your feedlots and poultry factories. Naturally, this smug account roused all my skepticism, and I questioned him about the economic drawbacks of such a system. My questions, however, met a flat denial. On the contrary, he replied, Our system is considerably cheaper than yours, if we add in all the costs. Many of your costs are ignored, or passed on through subterfuge to posterity or the general public. We, on the other hand, must acknowledge all costs. Otherwise, we could not hope to achieve the stable, state life systems which are our fundamental ecological and political goal. If, for instance, we had continued your practice of free disposal of wastes in water courses, sooner or later somebody else would have had to calculate and bear the costs of the resulting dead rivers and lakes. We prefer to do it ourselves. It is obviously not easy to quantify certain of these costs. But we have been able to approximate them in workable political terms, especially since our country is relatively sensible in scale. I obtained the detailed analyses on which his assertions are based, and have studied them at leisure. Extensive objective research would be necessary to con erm or disprove them. They do appear to be surprisingly hard nosed. Of course, the ecotopian situation has allowed their government to take actions that would be impossible under the checks and balances of our kind of democracy. Next, I asked the assistant minister about ecotopian food production and processing. I knew he must be aware of the great achievements of our food industry in recent decades, not only in the introduction of synthetic meat and other protein foods, but also in pre cooking and packaging generally. I was curious to see how he would justify the regressive practices that, according to many rumors, had returned Western agriculture to the Dark Ages, and cooks to their chopping blocks and hot stoves. Microwave ovens being illegal in Ecotopia. Again, I quote his reply at length. It is, I am discovering, characteristic of the way in which ecotopians justify extremist policies. You must remember. He began. 
That ecotopia at the beginning was faced with a stupendous surplus of food production capacity. California alone had produced about a third of the food eaten in the United States. Oregon and Washington had enormous fruit and grain production. We could produce, therefore, something like five times the amount of food needed by our own population. With food export to the U.S., ended because of the political crisis, our problem was how to shrink our agricultural output drastically. At the same time we wanted to end extractive and polluting practices in farming. Luckily, the new employment policies, which reduced the normal work week to about 20 hours, helped a lot. Also we were able to absorb some surplus farm labor in construction work required by our recycling systems. Along with simplification in food processing, we also achieved many economies in food distribution. As your grocery executives know, a store handling a thousand items is far less difficult and expensive to operate than one handling five thousand or more, as yours do. But probably our greatest economies were obtained simply by stopping production of many processed and packaged foods. These had either been outlawed on health grounds or put on bad practice lists. This sounded like a loophole that might house a large and rather totalitarian rat. What are these lists and how are they enforced? I asked. Actually, they aren't enforced at all. They're a mechanism of moral persuasion, you might say. But they're purely informal. They're issued by study groups from consumer co-ops. Usually, when a product goes onto such a list, demand for it drops sharply. The company making it then ordinarily has to stop production, or finds it possible to sell only in specialized stores. But surely these committees are not allowed to act simply on their own say-so, without scientific backing or government authorization? The assistant minister smiled rather wanly. In Ecotopia, he said, you will find many many things happening without government authorization. But the study committees do operate with scientific advice, of the most sophisticated and independent type imaginable. Scientists in Ecotopia are forbidden to accept payments or favors from either state or private enterprises for any consultation or advice they offer. They speak, therefore, on the same uncorrupted footing as any citizen. Thus we avoid the unfortunate situation where all your oil experts are in the pay of the oil companies, all the agricultural experts in the pay of agribusiness, and so on. This was too much. No doubt I said, it is scientists of this type who have frittered away the great industrial heritage you possessed at independence, and wrecked your marvelous street and highway system, and dissolved your fine medical centers. What benefits of civilization are they prepared to undermine next? I will not speak to any bit food questions. He replied. I can provide you with whatever evidence you require to prove that ecotopians eat better food than any nation on earth, because we grow it to be nutritious and taste good, not look good or pack efficiently. Our food supplies are uncontaminated with herbicides and insecticides, because we use cultivation for weeds and biological controls for insects. Our food preparation practices are sound, avoiding the processing that destroys food values. Most important of all, our agriculture has reached an almost totally stable state, with more than 99% of our wastes being recycled. In short, we have achieved a food system that can endure indefinitely. That is, if the level of foreign poisons dumped on our lands by rain and wind doesn't rise above the present inexcusable figures. The assistant minister scrambled to his feet, went to his shelves, and pulled down a half dozen pamphlets. You will find some relevant information summarized here. He said. Let me recommend that, after you have digested it, you follow ecotopian ways in not wasting it. This bad joke took me by surprise, but it did break the tension, and I laughed. He led me to the door. You may phone if you develop further questions. He said gravely. I returned to my hotel and read the pamphlets. One was a highly technical discussion of the relations between sewage sludge, mineral fertilizer requirements, groundwater levels and runoff, farm manure, and various disease organisms. Another, which struck me as particularly depressing because of its moralizing tone, surveyed food habits that had been common before independence, analyzing the health hazards involved. Its humorless approach seemed to imply that soda drinks had been some kind of plot against mankind.
Apparently, over a 30-year period, American soda manufacturers should have been held personally accountable for some 10 billion tooth cavities. This relentless tendency to fix responsibility on producers is, I begin to see, widespread in ecotopian life, to the complete neglect of the responsibility, in this case, of the soda consumers. My room boasts a trio of recycle chutes, and I have now, like a proper ecotopian, carefully disposed of the pamphlets in the one marked P. It is a good thing ecotopians do not have chewing gum, which chute would that belong in? May 7th. The stable state concept may seem innocuous enough, until you stop to grasp its implications for every aspect of life, from the most personal to the most general. Shoes cannot have composition soles because they will not decay. New types of glass and pottery have had to be developed, which will decompose into sand when broken into small pieces. Aluminum and other non-ferrous metals largely abandoned, except for a few applications where nothing else will serve, only iron, which rusts away in time seems a natural metal to the ecotopians. Belt buckles are made of bone or very hard woods. Cooking pots have no stick-free plastic lining, and are usually heavy iron. Almost nothing is painted since paints must be based either on lead or rubber or on plastics, which do not decompose. And people seem to accumulate few goods like books, they read quite a bit compared to Americans, but they then pass the copies on to friends, or recycle them. Of course there are aspects of life which have escaped the stable state criterion, vehicles are rubber tired, tooth fillings are made of silver, some structures are built of concrete, and so on. But it is still an amazing process, and people clearly take great delight in pushing it further and further. I was wrong to think more garbage trucks needed, actually ecotopians generate very little of what we would call garbage, material that simply has to be disposed of in a dump somewhere. But of course they do need more trucks to haul away material from the recycle bins. These people are horribly over-emotional. Last night after supper I was sitting in my hotel room writing when loud screams began in the corridor. A man and a woman, threatening each other with what sounded like murder. At first I thought I'd better keep out of it. They went off down the hall and I figured were probably going out or returning to their room. But they drifted back, yelling and screaming, until they were right outside my door. I finally stuck my head out, and found three or four other hotel guests standing around watching, placidly, and doing absolutely nothing to interfere. It seemed to be a matter of passionate affair coming to a bitter ending. The woman, hair half covering her teary but beautiful face, screamed at the man and kicked at him viciously, still no action from the onlookers, some of whom in fact actually smiled faintly. The man, his own face red with anger, took the woman by the shoulders as if he was about to bash her head against the wall, and at this, finally, two of the ecotopians present stepped forward and put restraining hands on his shoulders. Instead of knocking her brains out, therefore, the man was reduced to spitting in her face, whereupon she unleashed a horrible stream of curses and insults, things more personally wounding than I have ever heard, much less said, in private, not to mention with a bunch of strangers looking on. But the man did not seem humiliated or surprised, and indeed gave back insults just as dreadful as he got. The scene had gone on for perhaps 15 minutes, with more spectators gathering. It was more theatrical than anything I've seen in Italy. Finally the man and woman evidently ran out of fury. They stood limply, looking at each other, and then fell into each other's arms, crying and nuzzling each other wetly, and staggered off down the corridor to their room. At this the spectators began exchanging lively observations, making the kind of appreciative and comparative remarks we make after a particularly vicious round in a boxing match. Nobody seemed to care what it had all been about, but they sure got a kick out of the expression of intense feeling. Evidently restraints on interpersonal behavior have been very much relaxed here, and extreme hostility can be accepted as normal behavior. Maybe I'm not as good a traveler these days. Don't have much appetite for the sugarless ecotopian food, despite their pride in their natural cuisine. Find myself worrying about what I'll do if I get sick or have an accident. The ecotopians have probably turned medical science back 50 years. I have visions of being bled, like in the Middle Ages. Even began thinking almost fondly, last night, of my years with Pat and the kids. Maybe I'm beginning to miss the comfort of just lying around at home, why should this particular jaunt make me so confused and tired? It's an exciting story, an unusual opportunity, all my colleagues envy me. I just can't quite seem to get my hands on it. Kids used to come into bed with us Sunday mornings, and play bear comes over the mountain, giggly and floppy and lovable. Afterwards, when they'd gone out, Pat would infallibly ask when I was going away again. 
No man can live with reproaches before breakfast. But I loved her in my fashion. The ecotopian work schedule and the intermixture of work and play can make the simplest things practically impossible to accomplish here. Went to the wire office to file my story yesterday. It has to go via Seattle and Vancouver, since there have been no direct transcontinental connections since secession. Different clerk in the office picked up the copy, started reading it, laughed, tried to argue with me about the way I quoted the food guy. Look, I said, I'm just doing my job, how about you just doing yours? Put it on the fucking wire. He looked at me with real hurt, as if I'd just told him his office smelled. I didn't realize you were in such a hurry. He said, We don't get American reporters in here every day, you know, and what you're writing is really interesting. I wasn't trying to be boorish. You can't argue with these people. Go ahead, read it, I said, figuring to shame him into action. But he gave me an appeased glance, said thanks, and settled down to read. I drummed on the counter with my fingers for a while, but ecotopian leisure time had clearly set in. Finally, he finished, went over to the machine, sat down, turned, and said, Well, it's okay for a beginning. I'll send it real fast for you. Then he zapped the thing out at about 80 words a minute and came back to hand me the copy with a broad, pleased smile. My name's Jerry, by the way. I went to school with George, the assistant minister, and you got him down very well. I suppose I believe him. Anyway, couldn't help smiling back. Thanks, Jerry. I said, see you tomorrow.